There's an incredible part in this book that I just read called The Tiger. And in it, the author, John Valiant, introduces the research of a man named Charles Brain. So Brain's a paleontologist. But in the 60s and 70s, he was studying fossils in Transvaal. And he became really intrigued by a troop of cliff-dwelling baboons. In fact, he became so intrigued that he, did it, he wanted to do an experiment. This is how it went. He's going to clamber up into the caves where they sleep. He's going to wait for them to come back from whatever bam baboons do during the day. He's going to wait for them to come in, rest down for the night, and then he was going to scare them. Seems like a surefire plan. His idea is he wanted to see if he could scare them outside of the cave. He wanted to see if he was more scary or scarier than, than what existed outside the cave in the dark and that uncertainty. What happened was they stayed inside the cave. And so there was Charles, stuck in a cave with 30 irate, panicked baboons in the dark. What I find interesting about the story is, well, for one, that he did it. Um, I was trying to imagine trying to get that past the PhD proposal committee. I'm going to climb in a cave of baboons and scare them, see what happens. But also, I'm intrigued by the way that he, or by the behavior of the baboons. And to me, it seems like they were more afraid of going outside into this uncertain dark than they were of the intruder, which is peculiar, because what if that intruder was something more disastrous than a paleontologist? What I also find interesting about this story is that it kind of resembles our situation. Here we are today, we're talking about the future. And a lot of our discourse revolves around the idea of sustainability and the sustainability of our future. I like to imagine us living in a house of technology. And this house is something that we've been building for a long time. And with each new scientific discovery and new idea, we add to the walls of this house of technology. So much so that our lives are pretty much dictated by this house of technology and very little of our daily lives exists outside it. And so why I see this as similar to the caves is that well, we kind of taught, we're, uh, we're playing around with two different stories. Well, one, we can change the walls of this house of technology. We can adapt the technologies that we're comfortable with. But there's also another story of actually stepping outside the back door of this technology and embracing a completely new metaphor and a new paradigm of sustainability. Now, either way, it's kind of scary to think about. And in my research, I've realized that this fear is a universal fear. There's a psychologist named Jordan Peterson who who says that many organisms, including ourselves, have an innate fear of uncertainty. And we respond with the th same three mechanisms. We, we, we get taken aback, we withdraw. And as we do that, our heart starts to race and we become anxious. And then the third one is we become very cautious, our senses are alerted. But what if I told you that we could confront this uncertainty not on our own? What if I told you we could embrace possible 30 million examples of incredible ways of powering our future and creating functional, sustainable, and beautiful designs to universal problems like flight, like packaging, like creating complex structures and materials, using and creating color, or creating adhesives. This is the idea of biomimicry. And for me, it's completely changed everything. In a definition, biomimicry is the conscious emulation of the forms and the processes and the systems in nature to solve worthy problems. And more than that, it's a fundament fundamental transition in the way that we view nature, not as something that we could take from, but something that could actually teach us. And so far, the results have been pretty stunning. For example, a company in Toronto named Whale Power emulated the tubercles, those bumps on the front edge of a, of a humpback whale fin, and applied that to a wind turbine blade and found it's 20% more efficient, runs at slower wind speeds, and is quieter. Mercedes-Benz, they went to the reef-dwelling boxfish. You guys want one? <laughs> they went to the reef-dwelling boxfish and, and emulated that form, because reality is we're not lying down in cars yet. We still need to sit up, and so they're kind of boxy. But they didn't even stop there. They're also inspired by bones. And bones are super clever because they add material where the stresses and strains are highest, and they remove the materials where there is no stress and strain. So by doing this, they've created a lighter car without compromising the safety. The fuel efficiency of this car gets 70 miles per gallon, and it has a, a drag coefficient of 0.19. There's a group 
of young entrepreneurs at Smith. And they're inspired by Ivy. What's cool about Ivy is that they can mold to any shape. They're incredible climbers. That doesn't have to be a flat, boxy shape like the way we usually collect energy from the sun via our solar panels. They can mold to, sh to different shapes. They're inspired by that and they made the Solar Ivy, which does a similar function. It's a solar collecting mechanism that can attach to many different forms and different shapes. But they didn't stop there. They're also inspired by the way that the leaves rustle in the wind. And they thought, what if we collected that energy too? So these solar leaves actually collect the kinetic energy in the stems while simultaneously collecting the energy from the sun. I love this idea, but I know that bio-inspired designs is not new. And I'm not going to try and convince you that it is. People like Leonardo da Vinci, or if you know the architect Antonio Gaudi in, in Barcelona, Spain, they were both looking to nature for inspiration. Or even further back, you go to the Inuit, and the way they looked at polar bear dens to make igloos, or they copied the shape of an Arctic hare foot to make snowshoes. Bio-inspired bio designs is not new, but why I think biomimicry is so inviting and so intriguing is that it comes at a time where we've become completely fascinated with our own house of technology. And I think we've kind of forgotten that outside the house of this technology are, is the culmination of 3.8 billion years of research, development, and incredible design. And I think it's this, this, this idea that makes me so attracted to it and so intrigued. When I graduated from, from school, uh, I did a degree in environmental engineering and international development. And I would say I was fairly disillusioned at the prospect of our future. It seemed a little disheartening. But I worked on a couple projects in, in Indonesia and Sri Lanka on tsunami relief. And it was there that I started to see solutions in literally wild places. When we were trying to figure out how to make more tsunami resistant houses, we were really intrigued by looking at the destruction and all around it, the organisms and even ecosystems that didn't seem touched or seemed unharmed. And when we were trying to create breakwater berms to help dissipate future energy or the waves, uh, waves energy, it was intriguing to see as well that anywhere where the mangrove forest was intact or where there's an intact coral reef, inland of those, the, the human-made designs fared much better than without those. And really interestingly, we were trying to figure out a early warning mechanism or early warning system. And we came across countless stories of people telling us about domesticated and non-domesticated animals that days prior to the actual event all shot up uphill up um, away from the coastline. That's when my mind started to change and that lens started to change and I started to see that outside of this house of technology we've created, there are some good ideas. And what was also really intriguing was that these ideas are all free. They're accessible by, accessible by anyone. Even if you don't have access to nature, your human body is an incredible design. And this has started to, and, and in that sense, there are no trademarks, there are no patents, it's all freely shared. That has started to, started to deepen my conversation with the natural world and the questions that I ask. And what I've realized is that nature is incredibly hard to emulate. For example, making a box car, or a box fish inspired car, that's a great idea, you know, I think it's super cool and it, and it improves the efficiency of an automobile, but it doesn't change the fundamental problem with our dependency on oil or the, we still use a classic manufacturing technique of heat, beat and treat. When I met Janine Benyus, she's the woman who coined the term biomimicry back in 2007, she said to me, well, there's a difference between our house of technology and the natural world and that is nature builds with a beguiling simple set of common raw materials that are procured locally manufactured at body temperature and body pressure, and all processed silently in water. For example, spider silk. What an incredible design. It has a strength to weight ratio stronger than any material we've ever created. It uses only the energy of the sun to produce it. it. Makes it in the stinking critter's belly. And not only that, it's completely biodegradable, which means it goes right back to where it came from. And I, in fact, a lot of spiders will actually eat the silk and reuse it. And this is the conversation that I'm trying to have with the natural world and through biomimicry. It's not just to change the shape of our technologies and the, the way that our technologies look, but I'm trying to figure out how do we do design differently. 
For example, uh, there's a designer named Bill Reed, and he said the story once that if you're driving to Mexico and you need to get to Canada, which is a lovely place this time of year, you're not going to get there by slowing down. You're going to have to turn around at some point. You're going to have to step outside of that house of technology, that cave. And you're going to have to embrace a fundamentally new idea. Now, it's not to say we don't want to try and slow down, because taking a turn at 300 miles an hour is a little bit tricky. So yeah, we can slow down and improve the technologies that we're so comfortable with. But there's a point where we're going to have to think of a fundamentally new idea. For example, I think of our buildings. And the fact that every single building has an HVAC system just means that the design before it was pretty poor. I mean, why didn't we design that before so that we didn't have to build on a bad idea? I mean, for example, termite mounds. If you've ever seen a termite mound, that is the world's greatest HVAC system. And I'll tell you the story. I wasn't going to, but a termite mound can live in an environment that fluctuates from 2 degrees at night to 40 degrees in the heat of the day. Inside the actual mound, it, it maintains a 31 degrees Celsius. This is Celsius, by the way, sorry. <laughs> um, 31 degrees Celsius, plus or minus a degree at all times. An incredible gradient outside, and yet through its networking, through its tunnel, through its gas exchange, and its playing with the wind, it can maintain a constant temperature inside. Now that's clever design. So back to this deeper idea of biomimicry and embracing a new methodology, a new metaphor. This is something that I'm intrigued by. And I'm trying to figure out, well, how do we transition then? Because, like I said earlier, when we're confronted with uncertainty, there's withdrawal, there's anxiety, and there's caution. But I forgot to mention that there's actually a fourth one, and that's courageous exploration. Jordan Peterson says that if you can embody those three things, those, that fear, essentially, and then courageously confront this uncertainty, it's those organisms that then can adapt, evolve, and survive. So how do we transition from this old way of thinking? How can we do that without scaring the heck of it or out of ourselves? And what I found is nature does transitions all the time. And I've asked the question to ecosystems. If you clear cut a forest, or if, you, um, if there's a forest fire, some catastrophic release of energy and resources and materials all go back into the land, what happens is an incredible phenomenon. Life grows again. These are called R species, and what they do is they come into an ecosystem and they'll start to try. They're actually called the innovator species because they come and they try. They live and they die quickly. But there's a big difference. When they die, nature builds to make sure that it's safe fail, whereas we try to make designs that are fail safe. So these organisms, these R species, are continually coming in and they try and they live and they, and they quickly die. And they're doing a really important function. Well, for, for one, they're literally providing the groundwork for the next ecosystem to evolve. So they're providing the soils and the nutrients. But also they're testing. They're finding out what works here. What's the soil condition like? What kind of sunshine is here? So they're making sure that whatever comes next is locally attuned and adaptive and is appropriate. Up in Canada, this is what we're trying to play with. We're trying to become weeds. As we transition into this new idea of thinking, we're trying to find ways to convince people, policymakers, engineers, to confront this uncertainty, to try new ideas from the fundamental basis, to ask those fundamental questions. And the one thing we've done is we've created a collaboration. We're called the B Collab. And what it is, it's a, essentially a collection of unlikely collaborators. We have farmers, do-it-yourselfers, biologists, engineers, researchers. And our primary, primary function is to do biomimicry. One of the big projects that we're working on is a 17-hectare development, urban development, on the outskirts of the city of Guelph. And we're taking that metaphor of being weeds into this actual design as well. And the first thing we're doing is we're creating a design studio. And this studio is really just a platform for people to come and engage in learning about this place, trying new ideas, trying new designs, and seeing how they work, just like a weed would. So before anything else, we're making this design studio our primary function. And so we even have hiking trails going through there so that neighborhood people, kids, there's a Boy Scout camp across the river, they can join us and all participate in this design. And the purpose is, for example, to have biologists come and learn about the ecosystem, to do testing. We have a partnership between a biological university and a design university. So we can have the biologists come in and tell us about the land. And then we can have engineers and designers 
play with that information and try new energy technologies. What, what are the conditions in this place and how can we make very locally appropriate technologies? Not thinking about the traditional grid system. Let's start over. Let's pretend we just clear cut this whole land. How would you do energy? Why do, we do, why do we use electricity? Asking these fundamental questions. And then through this design, we're gonna hopefully create an opportunity for the community to self-emerge. And whatever comes out of that is hopefully locally appropriate and co-evolves with the natural world instead of trying to cut it down and start um, from scratch. So how do I think we power the future? I think we become weeds. And what that means is I think we get in our little groups and we collaborate with unlikely collaborators. And we try. And we try and we fail at smaller scales. And through that trying and learning, we start to provide, I guess, a sense of hope to the larger community, the larger system. For example, that urban design, we're working with city planners and trying to convince them to use this as a test site almost, for them to get comfortable with new ideas so that when they inevitably have to grow outside their boundaries, that they can maybe do it with a new metaphor, a new way of thinking. So we try. I think this is a, an incredible idea, this biomimicry and this bee collab, because one, it supports collaboration. It's inclusive. We had, in fact, a, we did a workshop with a bunch of high school students who we were playing with um, hagfish. If you guys don't know about hagfish, go check them out. It's incredible. Um, they were playing with hagfish, and we had all the postdocs and the PhD students kind of standing around uh, smirking and giggling at some of the stupid questions we were asking. By the end of it, every single one of them had their notebook out because these high school students were asking questions that was changing their research. Even the professor that we were working with, Dr. Doug Fudge, he's an international leader in hagfish research. He too had a whole new booklet and a whole new research project because these students were asking really childlike questions. So we can all be biologists, and that's the beauty about biomimicry. We can see design in the natural world, and it's inclusive. But not only that, it supports divergent thinking. And thirdly, it supports a sense of hope that we don't have to confront this uncertainty alone that there are 30 million species out there that do the same thing and solve similar problems to us. And these are three things that I think we're in desperate need of. And so, I call this the great collaboration because I think it changes and bridges the disconnect between you, between me, and between the, every other living organism on this planet. Thank you very much. <laughs>